much has been said in that already. About the faithful service that James been about here on Rainbow Express as director of our high school for the past 13 years. And the impact that she has had in the lives of our children and our whole families as well. And the fact that you're here tonight says so. But you know, the real impact that Jennifer has had can only be measured by eternal standards. For Jen, this wasn't a job, it was a ministry. For her, it wasn't a matter of duty, but of devotion. And having had the privilege of being able to work alongside Jennifer for the past 12 years in some capacities, I can testify to this truth. Time and again, I've seen Jennifer demonstrate that she cared more about than just giving us as parents a safe place to keep our children during the day. But it was a labor of love. And how do you attach a value to that? But I think you already know that because that's the reason why you really have your children here at Rainbow Express in the first place. Because at Rainbow Express, we're about more than just daycare. We're really about soul care. And Jennifer Grubb embodied that mission, I think, more than any of us could have asked for. On the back of your program this evening, you will find an excerpt that Jennifer included in each and every one of the reports that she gave to our congregation. And it says, may it be said of us that we have followed our vision, be it known to all who enter here that Jesus Christ is the reason for our school. He is the unseen and ever-present teacher in his classes. He is the model of his faculty and their inspiration. And this is the reason why Jennifer concerned herself with the deeper things. Because in the end, it really wasn't about the children. It was about Jesus. And all of this was the inevitable outflow of her relationship with him. In the verses that Marty read for us just a moment ago from chapter 18 in Matthew, we have depicted an all too familiar scene in the Gospels. We're told here that the disciples are talking with one another about who among them was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 1 says that that was the topic of their conversation. In fact, the Gospels of Mark and Luke provide for us a bit more information about the same incident and there we learn that they were even arguing with one another over who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. On another occasion, we read about a time when two of Jesus' disciples came to Jesus and they asked Jesus to give them the seats of honor in the kingdom. They wanted Jesus, he wanted them the seat at his right hand and the other the seat on his left. They thought Jesus could do that for them. Well, why wouldn't he want to do that for them? Because they're really special. Why shouldn't he do that for them? But notice how Jesus responds to this argument here in the opening verses of Matthew chapter 18. In verse 2, we read that Jesus took a small child and he placed this child in front of his disciples. And then he said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. For whoever then humbles himself as a child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. See, what we have here is Jesus taking a child in order to provide a living, breathing object lesson for his disciples about how one can enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we might look at these verses, and I first we might swoon over how much Jesus loves the children and how important they were to him. And that is true. The children were very important to Jesus, and that is part of the lesson that we have here in these verses. On another occasion, we read of a time when parents are trying to bring children to Jesus. They want Jesus to bless their children. But the disciples thought for whatever reason that Jesus didn't want to be bothered by the children, so they were keeping the parents from bringing their children to him. And when Jesus found out what was going on, the scripture says that he became indignant. And that means that he wasn't just a little disappointed in what his disciples were doing. In fact, it means that he exploded with anger. And he said, do not hinder the children from coming to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he said, if you don't get the special place that children have in the kingdom of heaven, then you really don't get me. 
But in Matthew chapter 18, if you look very closely at these verses, what you'll discover is that the real lesson that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples, the real lesson that he wants us to get from this text, is really not about the children. It's a lesson for you and me about how we may enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse 3, he says, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but the first thing that stands out to me about what Jesus said in this verse is the last part of the verse. For there we learn that not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven. So here we have these disciples engaged in this argument as they are wrestled with one another over the lofty position that they thought they each deserved in the kingdom of heaven. When all the while, they were presuming that they would be able to get into the kingdom of heaven at all. And I think for a lot of us, we begin with the assumption that we're automatically in. In fact, if you look at most any survey taken of religious affiliations of people in the United States, you will discover that the vast majority of the citizenry classify themselves as Christian. And I suppose that would be exciting if it wasn't for the overwhelming evidence against their claim. For upon closer inspection, one discovers that for all the people who claim to be Christian, so many of them, when it comes right down to it, have little to no understanding of what it really means. For many people, they call themselves Christian if it's just some political affiliation, or because it's their ancestral tradition, or because it just happens to be the most logical box they can check because none of the other options seem to quite fit. But in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus compared the way of entering into the kingdom of heaven to that of entering by a narrow gate. And Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Being a Christian is not settling for an estimated guess. Nor is it being able to determine for ourselves our own standing before God. Just because you profess the faith does not mean you possess the faith. It's possible to be deceived. And when we look to the scriptures, what we find is that the Bible clearly and repeatedly and emphatically stresses the fact that each and every single one of us is automatically excluded from the kingdom of heaven because of our sin. Romans chapter 3, there is none who is righteous, not even one. There is none who does good. There is none who seeks after God. Their throat is an open grave, with their tongues they keep on deceiving, and the poison of asps is under the lips. There is no fear of God in their eyes. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. So in order for any of us, to ever hope to be included in the kingdom of heaven, we first have to come to terms with the fact of our exclusion from the kingdom of heaven. Because we cannot get our own way into the kingdom. We can't make it by our own abilities, by our own, by our own charm, by our own merit. We can't. We must be saved into the kingdom of heaven. So how does that happen? What does that look like? Well, Jesus gives some very important information in verse 3. He says, truly I say to you, you must be converted and become like little children in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, to be converted means that you must change. It means you must turn from self-centered living to Christ-centered living. And here Jesus is talking about a radical reordering of one's life. He does not say you have to be a little bit better than you were before. You have to be a little bit better than the person sitting next to you. He does not say you have the improved version of the person you once were. No, he says we're going to start all over again. In John chapter 3, to the religious leader even, Nicodemus, Jesus explained it this way. He said you must be born again. And for us, that means we must repent before God. In order for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it has to begin with you repenting of your sin. And renouncing any claim that you thought you had upon your own life. When Jesus began his public ministry, he began by saying this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very first thing that he preached. 
Repent, to repent is to turn from our sin and to turn to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It is to embrace the truth, as the Bible teaches us, that the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ were absolutely essential in order to make the forgiveness of our sins, which separated us from God, possible. And that his resurrection from the dead is what made possible for him to make the, the, the promise that he gave for abundant and eternal life a living reality in you and me. And so, being born again is the gracious work of God. It is not something that we can accomplish. And this is why the Bible says that we are saved by grace. But Jesus goes on to say something else. He says, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, so we must become like little children. Now, what does it mean to become like little children? Well, hey, to become as a child here is not to become childish, but to become childlike. Now, maybe our knee jerk interpretation of this verse is to say that this means that we must be innocent as children. If you're a parent, you know that innocent is not exactly the best word to describe little children. The most basic fact that describes the condition of your children is their complete dependency upon mom and dad for their basic care. They depend upon mom and dad for everything, from the diaper being changed, from getting from point A to point B, and not just to be fed, but what to be fed. Not just to be clothed, but what they're going to be clothed with. And so it is when it comes to us, spiritually speaking. We must put our trust completely in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And when I say completely, I mean completely without qualification. And that is not to trust Him to give us everything that we want, but to trust Him for the quality of life that we will then live. It's trusting Him to call the shots, trusting Him to set the terms, trusting Him to order our steps, trusting Him to care for our lives as it really ought to be cared for. When we trust Jesus like that, then we understand that repentance and faith are things that go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. You will never understand what it really means to trust God until you have given up and completely emptied yourself of everything else that you have been holding on. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, we think of a time when Jesus was traveling and the large crowd was following him. That was often the way it was. There were Jesus when all kinds of people seemed to follow him. On this particular occasion, Jesus began teaching some things about what it meant to follow him. And a lot of people didn't like him. They were rubbing the wrong way. They didn't like him. They, just, they just did not want to accept him. And so it says, that many on that, that day who had been following Jesus were no longer following him. They abandoned him. And then Jesus turned to the twelve disciples and he said, do you want to go away too? And I love how the disciples responded. They said, Lord, we have no place else to go. I noticed that they did not say, Lord, we don't want to go anywhere else. They said, Lord, we have no place else to go. We have burned all of our bridges behind us in order to follow you. We have bet everything that you are right. And now our faith is inextricably bound with yours. That is a saving faith. And so the scripture says we are saved by grace through our faith. <coughs> I think one of the greatest acts of spiritual malpractice that is perpetuated about the gospel today is, is the teaching that it is so easy to be a Christian. Jesus said that in order to be a Christian, you must give up your life, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. How easy is that? Now, the gospel is very simple to understand. You don't need to be a rocket scientist or, or some heavy theologian to figure it out, but it is not easy. In fact, Jesus said, if you would be my disciple, you cannot die with him. Count the cost. For no one, after putting his hand in the plow and then looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. So only the thoughtful can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Yet, we are all under the burden of must. Because there is no other way into the kingdom of heaven than to follow after Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. 
much of the Father, but by me. And someday, someday, it will be for you. That the doctor will pull the sheep over your face. And that he will turn to your family and shake his head. And then what will you do after it's too late? If you've not reckoned your life with God today, what will you do then? How will you stand before Him? On your own merits? With your own excuses? I'll be honest with you, it's still so surreal to me. When I was on vacation, I got a text informing me that Miss Marty had abruptly needed to make a move to Florida. And I came home from vacation, it was on a Tuesday, I stopped in, spent some time with Jennifer, and we spoke. And everything seemed fine. As far as she was concerned, everything was fine, too. She did look a little uncomfortable with me in hindsight, but at the time, I guess I just chopped it up to stress. But then only on Friday morning, I believe it was Miss Dead, came into my study to inform me the night before that Jen had been taken to the emergency room because apparently for the past couple of few days, she had been experiencing pain. That was Thursday night. The very next Thursday, she died. Thankfully, Jennifer was prepared to meet the Lord. But how is it for you? But you know what? The importance of all of this really isn't just about fire insurance. The importance of this is about being reconciled with the living God. There is no greater joy. There is no deeper fulfillment than knowing that you know God and that God knows you. And, and the breath that you have in your lungs is air alone from the living God. This is life in the kingdom of heaven. Is there really anything more that we would aspire to? Would you really still spend your life building your castles on the sand? Would you really trade the kingdom for pot? given us this gift. The gift of salvation. And he's kind enough to show us the way. And he's kind enough to give us only one way. Because a man's way is not in himself. But God has given that way. And if you've not made that claim for yourself, I pray that you will not leave it without that result to do so. Don't put off till tomorrow, which you may not have the opportunity tomorrow to do. But if today, you hear his voice. Do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, it is an amazing thing that even an occasion like this could be an occasion of joy. But we know it's not that way automatically. You told us in your word that we do grieve, and we know that. We sorrow as we bid farewell to Jen. Yet though we grieve, we do not grieve as those who have no hope, because you've given us an abiding hope, and in Christ an anchor that is steadfast and sure. We thank you that Jen's anchor was steadfast and sure. Oh God, may we be among those who hold fast to the anchor that is sure. That when this world passes away, we will be found.